brothers and sisters, can you hear me? You need to turn the, uh, the volume up or the mic to the mic. Can you hear me better now? Or is it the same? Same. Can we? Maybe now it's better, right? Yeah. It's just turning the volume. Now it's better. So, um, thank you very much, uh, Brother Bobby and uh, the BGF team for inviting me and my Dhamma uh, sisters also. Thank you very much. And uh, before we start uh, this Dhamma uh, sharing, please allow me to just uh, chant a little bit uh, the Tibetan tradition. My medical sisters also, please, uh, if you could uh, join me and uh, let us take refuge and go to Jita. We already took a refuge, but it's a tradition that we also generate uh, the mind of enlightenment. So just imagine, yeah, so uh, keep your back straight. <clears throat> right, sit uh, upright. Put a smile on your face, your shoulders to the back. Sit very comfortably. Uh, and uh, so you may close your eyes or you may choose to keep it open. So now please visualize that uh, you are taking refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha on behalf of all sentient beings meaning that all living beings in the six realms of existence be they health beings, hungry ghosts, animals, human beings, asuras, yeah, the demigods or devas, the, the, those of the God realm so all the six realms they are all behind you. So all these six realms are behind you. And then you are bowing to the Buddha with as many bodies as grains of sand in the Ganges River or as many bodies as stars in the entire universe. The purpose of this exercise is to generate a mind of uh, humility, um, to know our place in the universe, that we are just a speck of dust in the vast cosmos. Right? So we are humbly bowing down to those who have gone forth before us, to those who have seen the reality of life, those who have understood, comprehended and have freed their minds from grasping and from all the mental poisons. So these are the enlightened ones that we are paying homage to. So with bodies, multiply your bodies as many as you can, as many as you can, billions and trillions of your own body multiplied and you're bowing to billions and trillions of enlightened ones in front of you. And then the entire six realms of existence, all the beings are behind you, your mother of this life, on your left hand side, your father of this life, on the right hand side, and behind you all the living beings. Whether you know them or you don't know them, whether they like you or they don't like you, whether you like them or you don't like them. At this moment in time, develop a mind of equanimity that I'm going to bow and I'm going to take refuge and generate a good heart for the benefit of all living beings, so invoke that sense of responsibility, humility, and also kindness and compassion that you are doing some service this morning for all sentient beings. And while you maintain the visualization, the Venerables and I will do the refuge and Bodhicitta prayer. So just very calmly, gently bow in your mind as many times as you can and with as many bodies as possible in reverence and gratitude. Sanghe chuta sukhe chuta pha chanchu padu dhani chapsu chi Dhaki chi sohi pe sunam ki ro la pe chi sanghe rupa shu Sanghe chuta sukhe chuta pha chanchu padu dhani chapsu chi 
from suffering and from creating the causes of suffering. May all beings be equanimous, free from the extremes of attachment and aversion. May all beings never be separated from the bliss of the true nature of mind. And now, brothers and sisters, before you open your eyes, gently dissolve all the Buddhas that you can see in your mind's eye, all the enlightened ones, all of their blessings, you dissolve it in a big ball of white light and then let the white light enter through the crown of your head and dissolve into the crown of your head. Dissolve all the Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, Dhamma protectors, all into your crown center. And rest for 30 seconds for a minute in that happiness that you have done some service to some beings. So gently open your eyes. Okay. So I hope that uh, you have, uh, you're more ready now. Yeah, you're balanced enough to be able to listen to the Dharma. So keep this in mind that you're listening to the Dharma for the benefit of all, yeah? So it's nice to come here to listen, uh, to improve yourself for personal development, for your own spiritual development. But while we are doing that for ourselves, even though we, the other sentient beings are not physically present with us, always, always keep them in your heart, wherever you go, whether you're walking, sitting, sleeping, meditating, listening to the Dharma, doing any kind of practice, doing your mundane activities, so always think that there are others in this world who are suffering in various different uh, you know, realms and even in the, in the human realm that you can see there are many of us who really really could need some prayers. Yeah. So many of us actually are having a difficult time. So keep all those beings in mind and whatever that you do, if you do it for the benefit of all, then whatever you do becomes very meaningful. It becomes a spiritual practice on its own. Not just when you come to the Dharma Center, but whatever that you do. If you're a lecturer lecturing in the university, for example, if you're going to lecture, just thinking that they are just my ordinary students, uh, and it's not going to bring much benefit. But if you lecture, open the door of the lecture hall and step in and think that I'm opening the door of liberation for the benefit of all, and then when you uh, hold the mic in front of your uh, students, or you start you know, talking and, and giving information to the students, think that you're actually talking to all living beings, all living beings of the six realms. You could even think that they are actually Buddha sitting in front of you and that you are actually uh, doing service for all. So if you have a mind of service for all sentient beings, every activity, regardless of how mundane it is, 
it becomes a spiritual practice. So there is actually no separation between ordinary activities and spiritual practice. The divisions are only, they only exist in our mind. That's why our mind is actually very powerful, it's a very crafty thing that we have, you know, that we carry with us from life after life. It's a mind that looms around trying to deceive us into thinking that everything is as it is, you know, but whatever that we see, whatever that we experience, it's not quite what we think it is. We, we see a different reality from what it actually is, right? And what is this reality? This reality, um, it's very difficult, it's a lifelong practice to be able to, you know, to clear the ignorance, the layers and layers of ignorance, like um, if you peel an onion, right? So it's like, uh, you know, the onion is not that difficult to peel, but it's very, very, you still need a lot of effort in order to peel the onion, right? You cry in the process. So in our Dharma practice, also we have to go through a lot of hardships in order to be able to uh, to reach a state where we can actually see the reality of life. So you will ask me, what is the reality of life? The reality of life is, 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 Any idea? If, yes, I would like the answers to come from you. The reality of life is there's nothing that is stable. Everything is impermanent. We are all subject to change, right? Momentary. Everything is in a state of flux. We are changing it all the time. But it's very difficult to see it, isn't it? Because we are not changing at the speed of light, are we? We are changing very, very slowly, very subtle changes are happening in our minds, in our bodies, so we think that we are actually permanent. That the idea of a permanent self is one of the lies, the deception, the biggest deception of our mind. How many of us, every day, every single point of the time, we think that we are impermanent? How many of us, when we do our things, when we get upset, when life difficulties come to us, or when we are doing any kind of work, maybe eating our favourite food, watching TV, just going about doing our ordinary work. And then at the back of my, our minds we think, oh, we have no idea. All the time, moment to moment. <laughs> All the time, right? How many of us, maybe like half of the time? Right? So, half of the time means half of the time our mind is lying to us, half of the time is waking up, yeah? It's an awakened state. So, so what good is it to know that life is impermanent? Does it make us better people? Does it make us more balanced? Can you... What, what good is it if you know that life is impermanent? Now, how does it change your circumstances? Become less delusional become less delusional, so which means that you try to understand the reality. Understanding the reality makes you less... You suffer less. You suffer less. Very good, yeah. So anyone else with uh, insights into your practice? Less attachment. Less, less attachment, yes. Okay, very good. Less attachment. Why? Problems are impermanent, right? Just as we are impermanent, the problems are also impermanent. What else is impermanent? Hmm? We are impermanent. Our work is permanent. Our our status in life, our our wealth, our possessions, our family members are they permanent? Sometimes it's easier to think that we are impermanent because we are going to the next life anyway, yeah? We are not separating from our so-called self, perceived self, right? So it's okay, I'm impermanent, we can accept most of the time, yeah? Because we are the ones going on this long journey of aeons of uh, reincarnation, uh, sorry, rebirths, right? So it's, we actually aren't really saying farewell to ourselves, isn't it? We're just continuing. But when we have to say farewell to someone else, 
does it have the same feeling when someone else is impermanent? Does that hit you? The do you, is it easier to accept? Which is easier to accept? Impermanence of self or impermanence of others? Okay, I'll give you a few categories. Impermanence of self, A, impermanence of self, B, impermanence of others, especially loved ones, C, impermanence of uh, possessions, for impermanence of status in life. C. Which one? C is the possession. So that is that is difficult or easy to accept? Easy to accept. So impermanence of... Uh, which one is easier to accept? Impermanence of self or impermanence of others? Others. Really? <laughs> impermanence of self easier to accept. So when something happens to us, do we do we freak out more or when something happens to others we freak out more? When something happens to others, why? The attachment. The attachment. Right. So because we are going on this trip, a long trip by ourselves anyway, so what if this body we lose, never mind, we're gonna get another one. So we will always be each other, right? We be with, with ourselves. There is a subtle kind of a sense of reassurance that we are we are never going to be annihilated. Right? We are going to be there all the time. But this consciousness is going to continue. But I may, ne I may never see my loved ones again. I don't know where in samsara my loved one is going to be born, if at all. Maybe they're going to get enlightened. And if I don't get enlightened, they get enlightened, I'll be, I'll be separated from them. All these kinds of ideas. Do you think about this or am I the only one? Do you go to that extent or am I overthinking? I think I'm overthinking. <laughs> Sorry? Overthinking. Because so, we always think of ourselves yeah. most of the time. Most of the time. We think of ourselves. So so then okay, so what do you think about yourself? Depends on the knowledge. If you are if you are ignorant, you think yeah. you behave like you'll be there forever. But yeah. if you have the Dharma realize that they're impermanent. But still it's very difficult to accept. Right. Like you say, most of the time you don't think of it. So which means that we have this moment, uh, some moments of realization, but the realization is not stable. Which means that we have not fully realized that we are impermanent. We have not fully realized that others are impermanent. We have not fully realized that phenomena is impermanent. Right? Now, is there anything in this world which is Permanent. Change. Change is permanent. <laughs> Nirvana is permanent. Okay. Right. So we always we so we chase for Nirvana because we still like the idea of permanence. So, so Nirvana is very reassuring. So we want to go there because it's permanent anyway. Yeah? So yes. you see, do you see? Yeah. Do you actually see what's going on in your mind? That we are chasing after permanence. Right? So, so the Buddha said that uh, when you know you are, well, have you ever, you know, reflected on the words of the Buddha? It's like a candle going off, right? Like a uh, nibbana, you know? so it's like uh, extinguished. So, do you not feel sadness that yourself is going to be annihilated? So, when you become arahant or you become a Buddha, right? Then you, you, basically, what would you become? What will you become? Nothing. You transform into something else. You go in a state where you're you're floating around. Hmm? Sorry. Gandharva. 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 So is Gandharva permanent? No, it was still changing. So is Gandharva part of the six realms of existence? Yes. Okay. So Gandharva is a form of Deva, right in the Deva Lokas. So, but they are very beautiful. Yeah, I think that's why we want to become Gandharvas. <laughs> For those of us who have got the little bit of sense of, uh, you know, maybe I'm not too beautiful, so you aspire to become a Gandharva or a Devi Devna, right? So, well, anyway, these are just some thought provoking questions just to uh, get us to understand that we actually are living in, in some deception. Moment to moment, we don't have that realization that life is impermanent, right? Now, is there any other deception that you know? that you want to share with me? <coughs> what, 
couple of venerables. Do you have any other exceptions that you think you would like to share? Okay, so now this body of ours, right? That this existence of ours, the mind and the matter. Now, are we uh, partless? Partless meaning are we um, just a block that uh, we are just, um, how to say, we were manufactured like this and sent down here from the heavens and then we, we are just, just that mess without, not partless, which means that we are unitary. We are not partless. I mean, we are, we are partless. That means we, we are not made up of parts. Who is just a block and is not, it's not made up of parts? Who understands that we are actually made up of parts? Different parts. Okay, just have a look at your, your own self. Maybe you have a look at me, right? Uh, so which part of me is karma children? You could pinpoint my nose. I know my grey hair is very outstanding. So, but that's not karma children. <laughs> So who is karma children? Which part of me is karma children? Is there a stamp on me, on my, on my genetic material? Maybe, yeah, on the genetic material. But, but is the genetic material permanent or impermanent? So if you burn my body, do you still find genetic material anymore? Right? So even DNA gets corrupted, isn't it? You can't extract DNA if it's already um, destroy, yeah? So now, back to the question, you still haven't answered. Are we unitary? Unitary meaning partless. Or are we made up of parts? So how? How are we made up of parts? Five elements. The five, five elements, okay. What are they? Earth, water, fire, wind, space. Right. So we understand that we are about seventy percent water, are we? Right. So um, then, what does that got to do with the discussion? Seventy percent water. We are made out of five elements. Um, what else? We are also actually made out of mind, right? Mind and matter. So just look at yourself. Is there anyone in this world who can say that uh, that there is certain part of your body which is actually you? You don't, yeah. So if I take out one by one my arms, my legs, my nose, my eyes, you know, just like peeling an onion, huh? you peel, 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 yeah. everything, what will you find? Nothing. Yeah. Empty. So then, do we do, what do you understand by that revelation that when you peel the onion, it's empty, when you peel karma children, then it's empty. So what, what does this mean? We are all empty. We are all empty. Empty of? Self. Very good. We can't just say that we are empty because we are actually full of everything else. The universe is not just empty. No, it's like, um, let's just say Kama Children here. Yeah? Kama Children is empty of her own self. But it's full of everything else in this universe. I remember, uh, do, you, do you know Venerable Thich Nhat Khan? Yeah. The, uh, the late Vietnamese Zen master? Passed away last year. Yeah. So what did Venerable Nathan teach us? He, he in in the Heart Sutra, uh, which Venerable uh, Nathan wrote, the book. Yeah. The Heart of Understanding. If you have, it's, it's not a very thick book. It's a very thin one. You can actually uh, get it uh, online. In in the Heart of Understanding, Venerable Nathan wrote that um, if you see a piece of paper, right? If you look at the piece of paper. Uh, just for one minute, just imagine that you're looking at a piece of paper just for one minute and then when you look at a piece of paper uh, what insights do you get? How did the paper come about? What was the paper before this? What was the previous incarnation of the paper? It was a... The paper comes from? Trees. trees. So, so then the trees, how did the trees form? from sunlight, water, earth, right? And then the, 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 the nitrogen, the bacteria, many other. Everything, at the end of the day, if you look at a piece of paper, can you tell me what 
element of nature is not in the paper. Except my, yeah, of course, yeah. But I'm talking about the physical aspect of phenomena. It's just like ourselves, physical aspect of phenomena, of ourselves. What, what in this universe is not inside us? We have the five elements, isn't that what the universe is made of? Right? So which means that, can you say that you are empty now? If I say that karma children is empty, is that correct? Why? Because I'm full of everything else, right? So that means empty of what then? Empty of a separate self, right? So which means that each and every one of us, when we study Buddhism, we are we tend to think that we are empty. And we are very happy that we are empty. But actually no, la, we, we, we like to think intellectually that we are empty. But when we realize that you know the emptiness is going to be like um, you know, you, you won't have that ego to, to to butter up your your you know you don't have that ignorance which butters up the, the ego and makes you feel proud of yourself for achievements, then it gets kind of scary, isn't it? Because we like to be praised. I know I like to be praised. Who doesn't like to be praised? I love praises. Ask my sister. <laughs> How is my hair today? Very nice. <laughs> How is my skin colour today? It's very nice. Well what good is it actually all these praises? When that when you're actually in empty of an inherent self. So please, the reason why I'm bringing this up today is just I wanted you to understand that we are empty of an inherent self, right? But we are full of everything else. So I'm empty of, so so karma children is made of non-karma children elements. This is what I did not answer. The paper is made of non-paper elements. So it is empty of its own identity, but it is full of everything else in this universe. So do you still feel very lonely if we find out that you are empty? Are we happy to be part of the universe? We are the universe, yeah? So that's why I, I asked you to imagine that you are you know, like the star in the sky, you know, the billions of stars, the grains of sand in the Ganges River. Because if you really look at it, that's all that we are. Basically, we are the universe, but we do not have an inherent self. That, but I don't want to go too much into this. Yeah? Okay, yes. How do we reconcile this, this contradiction? What contradiction? Between you are empty yourself, but you are full of full everything. Of everything. Yes. How do we reconcile this? To come to terms with it, yeah. yeah it's yeah. very difficult, exactly. isn't it? Yes. yes. So this is where the Dharma practice begins. So that's what Dhamma practice is all about, to reconcile the fact that the reality is that we are empty of our inherent self, but we are full of everything else. It's just a matter of uh, meditating on it and seeing it for yourself, the thought processes that occur in your mind, moment to moment thought processes, right? What goes on in your mind. So if you really close your eyes, let's close our eyes, let's reconcile. Okay, let's close our eyes, let's try to reconcile. Okay? So when you close your eyes, you observe, so you, you, maybe we do a breathing exercise. Today's class is going to be very experimental now. Yeah? It's nothing to do with the... I, I don't want to lecture, I just want to explore. Shall we do that? Yeah. yeah? Okay. So, breathing in, I'm aware that I'm breathing in. Breathing out, I'm aware that I'm breathing out. In. In, out. Breathing in, I'm aware that I'm breathing in. Breathing out, I'm aware that I'm breathing out. So you are breathing in and breathing out, just observe your thought processes, right? Now that you are in a relaxed state of mind, right? So you just watch your mind like an outsider, like you're stepping out of your mind, your, your, your head, yeah. <laughs> basically you're coming out of your head and looking at your mind. So you're looking at your mind and then you're seeing thoughts coming up, 
emotions rising. Maybe you're also feeling some pain in your body. Maybe some hunger in your stomach. Right? Some gas. <laughs> right? And also maybe some sensations. Some feelings. Pleasant. Pleasant feelings. Or unpleasant feelings. Just take a minute to really see what's going on in, in your mind. So the laboratory of life is actually in your own mind. So now let's go into the laboratory, open the door of the laboratory of your mind. And let's explore. Let's do some experiments. So the scientist inside you is now observing the mind. Where is the mind? What, is, what thoughts are popping up? And where do the thoughts come from? And if there are any emotions, where are the emotions coming from? Which part of the body do you think the emotions come from? Is there even a part of the body where emotions come from? Or do they just spring up without, without any origin? What about the sensations? Where are they? What are they? Painful? Normal? Neutral? What feelings are coming up? My mind, there are quite a number of things going on in the mind, isn't it? Are you even still here or you have probably reached a different country? Gone back to your kitchen? Most of us want to go back to sleep. Bed is very white. Where are your thoughts? What is the quality of your thoughts? What are you thinking? And is the same thought there all the time or are they changing all the time? So now gently open your eyes. Right? You have seen enough, I think, for some time. I think one minute is just enough. So who can tell me what did you see in your own mind? You open the door to the laboratory of your mind and what did you see? Did you see anything? I'm not, I'm not talking about seeing physically, like lights or anything like that. That's not important. Right? That's, the lights and, and Buddha images are also another perception of the mind. We're just conjuring up images, you know, from our subtle you know, mind, from the subconscious mind. Now, what did you see? Many things. Many things, yes. So, what, maybe, maybe you don't have to go into detail, but maybe just give some, you know, background as to what did you see? Okay. Up and down, up and down, here, there. So the mind is oscillating. Yeah. yeah. Whose mind was absolutely still perfect? Didn't move at all. Not to the left, not to the right. Never moves? <laughs> Okay, so we all know our minds, yeah. <laughs> and you also know our my mind also is the same. I also, my mind was going here and there, you know, everywhere. Okay, so now, did you know the quality of your thoughts? Were you able to see them? Or, were you, or did you fall asleep? You saw roughly somebody, you all saw something? Uh, did you see your thoughts? Were they pleasant? Unpleasant? Unpleasant. Unpleasant. But you, you are aware of the quality, what you felt, what you saw, right? And did you have did you want to control it? Did you want to get rid of the, the, the thoughts? Unpleasant? Okay, so how to reconcile? You asked me how to reconcile. I would like to say that don't control. Do not control your thoughts. We are not here to control, we are not control freaks. You know, we are here to let go, right? So just, we are here to observe, we are not participants. Were you actually observing you participating and putting more chili and pepper and making story after story? Which, what was happening? Who was observing? Who, who was participating? Trying to observe. Trying to observe. <laughs> so when those of you who were participating, did you even know that you were actually 
uh, were you aware or you were just happily participating, you're not sure where you were already? The storyline just went and then the train left. <laughs> Okay, so when you came back, eventually, right? You you went on the train somewhere, but you, you finally managed to come back to the station. Yeah, okay. So that's nice, isn't it? So which means that here, what is the point of this entire exercise? The point is that we are aware of our thoughts. We are aware of our feelings. We are aware of our sensations. We are aware of our emotions, right? Now, who can find the, the, the I mean, like, um, where the thoughts came from? Did you go and, did you, did you try to find the origin of your thoughts? Like, follow it and see where, where it, where it came up from? And where is it going? So before the thought goes, hey, come back, come back, let me, let me, let me follow you. I want to see where you go and where you're coming from. So you're standing at the corner. When the thought comes up, ah, I've got you, like that. Anybody? That's, that's my mind. So I can tell you what rubbish goes on in my mind because my mind I want to see where the thoughts come from. Right? It's just to try to understand. And you know what? I'm never successful because I can never find the point of origin of my thoughts. And then when the thoughts go away, I say, don't go. I like you so much because it's a very indulging thought. It's a thought of attachment towards somebody. I like towards my cat. Yeah? I love my cat. So don't go because I have this beautiful image of my, my cat. Baby eyes and then the thought goes and then after that comes another thought which is my, my work related thought and i don't want that work related thought i don't want it but i want my big eye cat thought so what to do how to bring it back again are we supposed to bring back the thoughts are we supposed to follow the thoughts should i what should i do or should i just sit back and just watch my thoughts like a movie just watch just watch yeah so what is good what is the good thing about watching your thoughts so that at some point in time I can jump on the train and participate again, no? Okay, so the good part about it is that when we sit down and watch our thoughts, we, we come to an understanding that it's just like a movie. Our minds are actually so, you know, busy. So we are all the time busy with something. Our minds never have the time to rest. Right? We are always thinking from one to another, one to another, and it is a, that is the way we are in this world. So in like Tibetan, my Tibetan language teacher is here. So it's like Drova Semchen, so it's like uh, sentient beings who are in, like a moving, right? Right? So you're moving, moving. So why did the Tibetans say we are Drova Semchen, like we are moving? In one way you can think that we are moving from one life to another life, but that's not the real meaning. The real meaning is that we are moving all the time in our minds. Can you imagine how, if we, if we look at the, the Buddha, three aeons, three aeons of cultivation, and then the Siddhartha was the last, uh, you know, in birth. But before that, so many, 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 you know, uh, lifetimes of a Bodhisattva career, three aeons, until finally he was reborn as Siddhartha and then became Gautam Buddha, right? So can you imagine how <laughs> how many how he's been wandering, 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 wandering for oh, so many, many different times. So we are also wandering. So we are wandering, wandering, wandering. And you know what? Uh, it, the Siddhartha took like I mean, the Buddha took three aeons. So how many have aeons have we already been here? So this is talking about Buddhist cosmology. I mean it's like a you know, little bit here. Yeah. So in our texts, in our uh, sutras, the Buddha did mention that he, he had a long, 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 long career of three aeons from the time he first generated the mind of enlightenment. Three aeons is not like three, 30 years or three lifetimes. An aeon is it's a tremendous number of lifetimes. You know, and if, if, if it took, you know, the Buddha was, was finally enlightened and it took him that number of years, I mean lifetime, so can you imagine us? It might be have probably been here for like 30 aeons, maybe more, right? And uh, judging from where my mind is, I think I'm going to go for another at least 20. Because it's never stopping. And the reason why we are going, we keep on going one after another after another rebirth, is because 
How can you stop your rebirth if you cannot even steal your mind? That's the point. So if we talk about reconciling, so we talk about emptiness, we are empty of self, our inherent self, but we are full of the universe. So well, if you look at the laboratory, if you go back into the laboratory of your mind and you observe, there will come a point in time where you don't have to reconcile. The reconciliation happens on its own. Leave it be. Let it go. So when you look at your mind, there comes a point in time if you are, you know, your mind is focused enough on one single point, where you could just look at your, your thoughts, there comes a time when the mind gets sick and tired of running. And that's our true nature. Our true nature of mind is not that of running up and down. We are not that. That is just a layer that is, has been persisted because of our habitual tendencies. But our actual nature is, is to be still. It's not to run. Isn't that good news? Or isn't that reconciliation? So it's a reconciliation without actually grasping at anything. That's reconciliation. So you stop grasping, then you reconcile. It will be on its own. So that is just the introduction for today. <laughs> and I wanted to talk to you about the mind. I want the reason because the topic is the power of the mind. And I wanted to impress upon you that the mind is very powerful. But guess what? You know, the awareness that we are we, we practice in daily life, that is the key to unleashing the power of the mind. So if we keep on going through the motions, we go into our mind and we don't stop, we just keep on running, 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 grasping at permanence, you know, and fearing impermanence, so grasping at ourselves as if we are going to be here forever, grasping at others, grasping at this and grasping at that, then we are, we are just perpetuating that habitual tendencies of running, running, up and down, up and down, oscillating between past and future likes and dislikes. So, I mentioned in many of my previous talks before, I think some of you are sick and tired of listening to this, but I think it's very important to, to keep reminding everyone, including myself, that our minds do four major things. In fact, that's our, the preoccupation of our mind is four things. So, who has been to my talks before they will know? Number one is dwelling in the past. Number two is going to the future. Number three is pulling at things that we like. Number four is pushing things that we don't like. So, past, future, likes and dislikes. So, aversion and attachment. Right. So, that is it. So, you, when the next time you close your eyes, if you have that level of awareness, you could actually, you don't need to categorize, but just understand the quality of your thoughts. That's exactly where we are going. And with the, the, the practice of mindfulness in our daily life, right? We develop that we are that fairness is there as to what we are doing, moment to moment, what we are doing. We become more and more aware. Our minds are so full. There's no space. So that's why we land ourselves in trouble. So the power of the mind is such that if you clutter it with all sorts of things, you don't give it any space to actually go back to its true nature. Once you let it rest, go back to its true nature, then you see that the mind becomes very powerful. But how to do that? What is the key to unleashing the power of your mind? I've already said just now if you were listening. Sorry? Uh, yes, in a way, but what is the, the actual word that I used? Yes. Shoot, somebody is listening. Thank you. <laughs> So okay, so awareness is, is, is the key to unlocking the potential of your mind. So now the question is awareness of what? So what what are you what are we supposed to be aware of? Are we supposed to be doing anything? This word supposed to be is actually like an instruction and our mind doesn't like it. It's supposed to do this, mind resists, it's supposed to do this, mind will resist. But if you say, okay, do that whatever you want, then that also the mind doesn't want. How can, you know? So the, the last thing that we can do is actually give instructions to our mind. The mind doesn't want to listen to it. Yes, correct? If I were to tell you, you're supposed to do this, that you will do everything the ex exact opposite. You're supposed to remember things, but you don't do it. The mind doesn't want to do it. So how to do it? How to train the mind? So it, Buddhism 
the Buddha said, if somebody were to ask you, what is Buddhism? What did the Buddha teach? What would you answer? Avoid evil, do good, purify your mind. Very good. So avoid evil, do good, purify the mind. So now, avoid evil is on the basis of morality, right? Our ethical discipline, we don't kill, we don't steal, you know, we take the five precepts, right? Not to kill, not to steal, not to engage in sexual misconduct. That will get us, get us in a lot of trouble, yeah? yeah so, um, not to lie, yeah? harsh speech, yeah. gossiping, idle talk, and then not to indulge in substances, yeah? So that, um, uh, intoxicating substances. So these five are the very basic for the they uh, brothers and sisters, and then we have got a, we have got a few more, yeah. <laughs> but it's but it is actually within that framework. The Buddha is very really scientific. He has got like three, four, what two? Yeah, yeah, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You read the sutras, you know, right? Got a lot of categories, isn't it? So sometimes you get sick of the categories. The categories, the number doesn't matter. The idea is the five precepts is the basis. And then after that, you have got your shamatha meditation, your samadhi, sila, samadhi, panya, which means your morality, ethical discipline, your samadhi, meaning your mental culture, mental cultivation, and then the third one is the wisdom. And do you do this today? I, I observe my ethical discipline, tomorrow I jump to meditation, the day after I will do wisdom, I will listen to dharma. And then, uh, Wednesday, I come back again to an ethical discipline. Is that how uh, it works? Who says that all these three have, has to be, I'm not saying has to be, I, I mean, preferably done at the same time, simultaneously? Or, or should it be consecutively? I do one, then tomorrow I do another. Who says simultaneously? Raise your hands. Come on, this is not class. This is, this is sharing. I'm, I'm not here to lecture you. But who says it's. Uh, consecutively. That means you do one, then after that you do the other, then you do the other. Right. But we do that anyway, right? We we say it simultaneously, we understand, but we do it consecutively. So to so we are basically sometimes we observe the ethical discipline, but sometimes we don't we don't want to. But some we say that we will then sometimes we say that meditation we wait now. We will go for retreat at the end of the year when we get leave, right? Correct or not? And then uh, to develop wisdom only when somebody comes and say, oh, whenever it's coming to BGF. So this today is the day of wisdom. Tomorrow is back to the <laughs> So so actually all these three can be developed moment to moment without any teacher. Why? So you don't need to, to wait for Sangha to come and teach you or any Dhamma brother and sister to come and teach you or go to YouTube. You don't need to wait for that. I'm not saying you don't need that. I'm, not, I'm saying that you don't need to wait for that in order to practice. How? How to practice? This is related to unleashing the power of the mind here. Yeah? First, you need to establish your practice. How to establish the practice? Well, guess what? If we don't have ethical discipline, if we have killed something, the next moment you jump onto your meditation cushion and you sit there, what will happen? When, hmm? You will have right. The, it will it will come back in your mind. Imagine if I were if I stepped on a cockroach, or if I sprayed a cockroach to death. Right. Let's just say, okay. Um, and then I feel remorse. So I'm not saying that you know what you should do. I'm just saying what I what happens to me, right? So when, let's just say if I I'm terrified of cockroaches and then I tell my people, get rid of it, I don't care how, just get rid of it, I run out of the house and I expect the cockroach to do the same, but it doesn't, it stays in the house, I run out. You know, so, uh, so what happens is that uh, then I say, my people, you're the compassionate one, can you do something about it? So because if I see the cockroach, I'm going to, I'm not going to kill it, but I'm not going to be in the same house. You know? uh, you know, so I might not be very compassionate to a cockroach and I might accidentally step on it. Just kidding. Yeah, but this is just a hypothetical situation. Let's just say I take a broom and I get rid of the cockroach. Pum! Gone. Okay? So then after that, the time for my meditation practice is only 7.30 p.m. I sit down there, who will come into my meditation? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you have experience with them, right? 
So, so in the same way, if you have hurt somebody through your words, you know, if you have, uh, you know, there's maybe some clandestine affair somewhere here and there, you know. So, do you really think that your mind will be at peace, or, or it will come back to you somehow or other? So that's that's how morality, ethical discipline works in Buddhism. There is no moral policing. No one is there to tell you what to do and what not to do because your conscience is the one that will prick you. And, and that too during meditation, right? Yeah. If for those of us who have done it, meditation a little bit here and there, we can experience it, right? Okay. So okay, we keep our ethical discipline. Then we practice meditation. So when to practice meditation? Morning five minutes, evening five minutes. Is that enough? Good deal. Done for the day. Perfect. We're good Buddhists. We have done our <laughs> homework. So when to practice meditation? Wow, that's very profound. Thank you so much. Do you believe her? <laughs> Is she is she is she you know over exaggerating or or is she is she does she have a point? Practice mindfulness that is already uh, meditation. Right. So if you look at the noble eightfold path, you see we have the four noble truths, right? So the fourth noble truth of Buddhism, which is actually the first teaching of the Buddha, the four noble truths that the noble eightfold path can be divided into three categories. What are those categories? Sila, Samadhi, Padya. So which means ethical discipline, meditation, yeah, mental culture, and then the third one is wisdom, right? So now, all our enlightened brothers and sisters here will tell me which comes under ethics. Which are the noble eightfold, which are the, of the eight? Okay, which ethics was tell me which one comes under ethics? Hmm? Right speech. Right speech. Right speech. Right speech. Right speech. Right because everything comes from the mind. If you have a good, if you have a correct understanding of what you're doing, right, then you will have a correct speech. If you have, then that's right speech. Too. So then, if you have right speech, if you have correct understanding, you'll have right action, right. And then, it also the livelihood that we undertake. That's also very important. What else? Is that all? Okay. So now, what about um, meditation? Right? Effort. Effort, very good. Mindfulness. Right, mindfulness, that's correct. Yes, and then only right concentration. How many? First we had four, then we have three. So then what about uh, the... Hmm? In a way, the right thought, the right understanding can be in the in the mental realm, the wisdom realm, but it's also actually the one that is governing our uh, yeah, so right understanding, then right view. <coughs> so right view. So okay, done. Yeah? So it's not necessarily only some of it can also come into the when you have the right thought, right? Then you will not have because body, speech, and mind. This actually is our karma, right? So that's why it actually is ethics. Ethics is not only what you speak and what you do. It's also what you think. So it's very debatable. Sometimes the right thought, yeah. So usually people clump it into the the wisdom, but that's also actually in the realm of discipline. If you don't discipline your mind, then your thoughts will be. Your, th your thoughts will be negative, isn't it? So now, the next part of the discussion will be focusing on negative of mind and how to transform it into a positive mind, yeah? So you are here for that actually, not here for all the other things that I've been talking about. I, mean, I can feel the vibes, okay? <laughs> but you know what, we've got to do our homework before we jump into exciting things, isn't it? Okay. So now, we, are, we have done our ethical discipline. Then we have our mental concentration. And the concentration starts with effort, right? So we have the effort. So effort to do what? So effort to do? 
moment to moment, what are we supposed to be doing? Not supposed to be. What what you think is good for us? Yourself. So mindfulness means what? The mind that is full? Or mind that is empty completely? So this word mindfulness also actually is very misleading, isn't it? Mindfulness. So people would think that my mind is full, great, I'm already mindful. So, so, okay. so mindfulness is the quality of mind that you are able to remember. It's actually smriti. You know, samyak smriti. Samyak smriti means right recollection. That is the word mindfulness. Actually, the word is recollection. What are you supposed to recollect? Again, I'm talking about supposed. What, what do you think you should be recollecting? You're collecting the teachings, bringing in the Dharma into your daily life. So that is the recollection. So if we forget, then, then we are in trouble, isn't it? So when we forget the teachings, then our conduct becomes, we go astray. So do we all the time remember that we're supposed to say any nice things? Sometimes we scold also, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Correct or not? So is it all the time that we think that? So who has a perfect recollection of uh, mindfulness that you, you, you can maintain it 24-7, moment to moment? Okay. So, okay. Who says that uh, they have some mindfulness uh, and they are working on it? Okay, great. So if you have that, then you are on the right path. Because the mindfulness is a prerequisite for your shamatha meditation. Correct? Why? Why can't you just jump on your cushion? Like the whole day we just go about doing all these things, cluttering our minds, and at the end we come to our cushions, we sit down and then we try to meditate. Does it work like that? Why doesn't it work like that? Yeah, it does take a longer time, more investment, yeah, more time investment. The other thing is just that we we are actually if the meditation occurs during our moment-to-moment -moment activities, but that I will save it for another day. But just suffice to say that our mental recollection is very important in the daily activities that we do. Eating, sleeping, drinking, standing, walking, yeah, talking and then doing all the other things, yeah? And then the last one, uh, right view, uh, sorry, uh, wisdom, wisdom. So what is wisdom? Uh, how do we develop wisdom in daily life? I mentioned to you, you do not need a teacher all the time, right? You are your own teacher and everything else in the universe is your teacher. So what about wisdom? How can wisdom come into your life on a moment-to-moment -moment basis? And the reflection is rooted in? What is the one thing that I said that will unleash your, the power of your mind? Awareness, yes. So if you are aware, right, then you will recollect. Then the re recollection, the smriti becomes very easy, right? So because you are all the time aware of the quality of your thoughts, so you are aware. When you eat, how you're supposed to eat. When you walk, how you're supposed to walk. When you talk, yeah? And then how, how are you, you know, you conduct yourself. And then when you meditate, also the awareness is there, right? And then when you are trying to cultivate wisdom, the awareness is there. So how to cultivate wisdom without reading a Dharma book, without going for teachings? I'm not saying that you should not go for teachings, should not read a Dharma book. I'm just saying that if you don't have time and you're doing other things, and then you save the wisdom practice for another day where you can attend the teachings. Is that the way to practice? How can you bring wisdom into your moment to moment, your daily life? Present moment. So you have the understanding that don't waste the present moment. So that all comes under mindfulness, awareness. What else? You reflect. Yes. What do you reflect on? Impermanence. Dissatisfactory, dissatisfactory, and then non the non-self. Yeah. So when I talk to you about all this, now this sister is saying that the wisdom practice can be done if you are aware of impermanence. So you constantly recollect impermanence, constantly recollect impermanence in everything that you do. Constantly recollect that the 
that this world actually is full of you know difficulties yeah you know in order for you to be able to come out of difficulties the first thing is not to live in denial you must acknowledge that you have some difficulties sometimes it's very difficult to deal with uh, you know, like us handle students or, or you know family members who have who deny that they have got some kind of a issue and that denial is is very very uh, counterproductive so once we accept once can you hear me i think something happens Hello, can you hear me? So once we accept, we accept that there is uh, dissatisfactoriness, then we do something about it, isn't it? So when I say that we can bring wisdom into our daily life, meaning that we reflect on emptiness, uh, sorry, impermanence, we reflect on impermanence, meaning things are changing all the time. We keep on reminding ourselves that things change, things change, I change, so the other person also change. Don't change other people. That's not what we are here to do. We are here to accept. We are not here to meddle. Right? So we, we, we don't change other people. So we, we just look at it and then try to understand the processes of change. The nature can teach you that. Just look out and look at the leaves, how they change, how the seasons change. Right? Look at the sky. You know how the clouds are changing all the time, they are moving. That's impermanent, isn't it? Look at your own stomach. One minute full, the other minute hungry, really like me. Very fast. Within five minutes, vegetarians are hungry all the time. <laughs> After ten minutes, you're finally going to the future. It's so like this, yeah? So that's impermanence. So you see how fun. It's so fun. Dharma practice is fun. Yeah? So it's not about looking at the Dharma book and then it's like, oh, I'm a Dharma practitioner. Right? There's no joy in it whatsoever. <laughs> Dharma is like a sentence, you know. It's like I'm, I'm here to do the motions because I have to get enlightened. Otherwise, you know, I miss the boat. You know, that's not how we do it. We do it because we just enjoy practicing, right? Look into your garden. Look into your neighbor's house. No, like, I mean, <laughs> look at your colleagues. Look at everything. Look at your body. Look at your hair. Look at my hair. Yeah. So if you don't have grey hair, you can always look here. <laughs> so anyway, so you see, impermanence, you can look at it, the nature will teach you. Even your body is aging, right? So second, you look at uh, the life is suffering, so you know that there are things, sometimes they come up, like uh, things come, opportunities come, opportunities go. Friends come, friends go. Sometimes they are good, sometimes they are not so good. So these are all life's difficulties. We, but once we understand the nature of life, we stop becoming so miserable. Right? That is wisdom, isn't it? Do you need to pick up a Dharma book in order to see that uh, sometimes, you know, there is happiness in your family, sometimes there is not happiness? Does a Dharma book teach you that? Or you already know before you even picked up, before you even met Buddhism? Yeah, you knew, right? Instinctively, you will know. And then the third is the one that we were discussing about this emptiness thing, right? So we're talking about, we do not actually have a, 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 an inherent self. So we establish that we are partless. I'm ah, sorry, we are, we, are, we are made of parts. We establish that our body is changing all the time, right? And then we also establish, we haven't established this one thing yet. Dependency. We are dependent beings. So, so the biggest illusion, actually one of the greatest illusions that we can live without anyone. So we are here because I made it in life, you know? It's like you are sitting down there and I am here. <laughs> it's like uh, it will take some time before you sit here. It's like that X for smugness and it's completely it's an antithesis to our, our work spiritual enlightenment. So what what is this dependency? I'm here because of you. And you are here because of me. So we are interdependent like this. Yeah, it's very important to understand that whatever that we have achieved in life is because somebody else had a play, had a role in it. Even our morning breakfast comes because somebody has delivered, somebody has made the bread, somebody has delivered it to our house, or we go and buy it, somebody has sold it, you know, somebody has procured the, the, the ingredients, and the ingredients came from the universe, so the entire universe comes into play, including all the sentient beings to bring the food onto your table, that's dependency. The water, we are dependent on water, without water we can't survive, without food we can't survive, without air we can't survive, so what, what is it? 
So meaning that we are not, if we are partless, we are just a block, nothing goes in, nothing comes out, no food, no poop, yeah? <laughs> Isn't it? But we are dependent, right? So that's, that's the thing. So when the success that we have today is due to our teachers, our parents, our brothers, sisters, our Dharma brothers and sisters. We have, I have so many Dharma brothers and sisters here who have helped me in my journey. Sisters here, venerable, yeah. So, so many. So, my parents. So, so many people are here. So, if we forget to acknowledge the people who have helped us, we forget to acknowledge the universe. So, then, then we become very miserable people and we become very arrogant people also. So, three things to reflect on as we are going about our daily life, we, should, we must spare a thought for how we actually came about like uh, the causes and conditions so people have helped us, the universe is consistently helping us, right? So that is now the end of my first part. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> We've got some time left. Is it until what time? Really? 11.30. So fortunately, I have enough time to talk to you about the second part. So we have just done, done the groundwork. Groundwork is very important. Yeah. So usually we want to, there is a saying, I mean, my saying, not the saying. Uh, Venerable and I coined this term. So we are at the base. Uh, we are, you know, enlightenment is very, uh, it's an arduous process, isn't it? So we want to, you know, it's like uh, climbing up a mountain. So you climb up a mountain, you go round and round and round and round and round. You take your days, days and days and days and days before you reach the peak, isn't it? Right? But what we do nowadays is that we say that some, usually people say Vajrayana Buddhism is the fastest way to enlightenment. So we say you take the helicopter, you reach there. Is that true? So instead of going, walking up, walking, 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 and then reaching the summit after a few hours, few days, few months. Right? So why why do hard work? You can just take the helicopter directly, you can reach the top already. <coughs> That's how people sell Vajrayana Buddhism, isn't it? It's better Buddhism. So you don't need to practice anything. Just take the helicopter and reach the top. Is that correct? Right? It's not correct. Oh, is it correct? No. Right? So now I just think that I made you walk round and round and round and round the summit because we are not going to take helicopter to go up. Right? So that's why you need to go through the motions of listening to the preparatory teachings before we go into the real thing. Even if there's such a thing. <laughs> so, okay. So, now, unleashing the power of the mind. We have learned some concepts of the mind. So, let me, let me give you a, uh, a little bit of understanding about some teachings that we call mind training. So Sister Jenny said just now, do good, and what we will do good and purify the mind. So how do we purify the mind? Unleashing the power of our mind means that we are actually putting the mind to some work. The mind just doesn't do, doesn't become, uh, you know, powerful. The mind is already powerful, but it's just that to harness that power of the mind, you need to even a little bit. Uh, in like, it's not a very, it's, actually, it's not a very good, um, it's not a very good simile. But forgive me, it's not a very good simile. But uh, it's just like uh, you know, in the past the cowherds, you know, how they used to, uh, you know, whip and lash the the cows. You know, it's it's, it's very cruel, it's inhumane. But uh, some, but for our mind, it's needed in a way, yeah, not to whip and lash it, but uh, in order to steer it to the right direction. So, because our minds can run, can wander off like a horse you know, into the into the horizon, or the monkey mind just uh, moves around. If we don't tie it to the pole, it is never going to be able to sit still, right? So, what is the anchor? The time I'm asking, what is the anchor? The anchor that ties the mind to the pole. Forget about the whip and lash thing. Yeah, I don't want to be. Breath. 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 The, breath, the breath is a method, it's a tool, but what is the quality of the mind that is needed to, what is the rope, what does the rope symbolize actually? Focus. Tell the mind to 
focus. Focus. I focus stems from. Someone very else. good. At the end of the day, everything boils down to awareness. It's a very simplistic, over simplistic way of saying, but it's suffice for it. I mean, for us to understand that if you have awareness, you're safe. So okay. So now we we are. So now, how many of us have had bad things happening to us uh, in the last one week? Bring that to mind, please. We do some exercises. In the last one month, in the last one year, uh, okay, right? So I would like to, this the second part is going to be very exploratory, okay? Everyone just um, bring to mind uh, something which is very uh, disastrous in our life that we, uh, we have been reduced to tears, it has been very inconvenient for us, it has cost us uh, some losses in our business or whatever it is, something which is very, very difficult to handle and you think that it's so overwhelming, I would like you to bring it up now in your mind. Let's do it. I'm sure you have it, otherwise you won't be here. I know you guys because that's why I'm here. So. <laughs> this teaching is more for me than for you. So think of a mishap or think of an unfortunate circumstance in your life. Some of us have repeated problems, endless problems, keep on recurring, 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 recurring. So just think of one major one. Can we do that? One major one. Everybody. And you stick to that for the next half an hour. Don't change. Something very, very problematic in your life. Maybe somebody is giving you a difficult time. Maybe you have got some business difficulty, difficulty, health issue, anything that that is troubling you and that occupies ninety percent of your mental space. Please bring that to mind. Research has shown that uh, our thought patterns are always recurring, isn't it? The, our thought patterns are recurring, and more than ninety percent of the time. Our thoughts are actually the same old thoughts coming up again and again and again and again. And if you know the quality of your mind, think of that one incident. Okay? Right. So now I will I'm going to give you some kind of a tool, right? For you to be able to handle it. So when misfortunes come into your life, what is the first thing you do? Usually, usually, get upset or take revenge or get even or both. Now, I would, I would like you to understand your mind. That's why I'm, 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 what kind of responses when something bad happens to you, what do you do? Do you say, may you be well and happy? May I take all the losses upon myself? May this be a cause for the, you know, for the, uh, you know, the, well, the ripening of my karmas now? May, be a, may it be a cause for the enlightenment of all? How many of us are that benevolent? Right? Okay, but we can be. Okay. So now, <laughs> so now we are going to transform, okay, the way we, we react. First and foremost, think of that very, very uh, difficult situation. And the second, try to bring to mind the methods, the way that you have been dealing with this issue. What is your habitual tendency? How do you usually respond to it? You don't need to tell me. I already know. Because I'm just like you. Maybe was. Okay, so we respond with anger, sadness, anxiety, we, we get stressed, worked up, worked up, all these things, yeah? Is there a better way to respond? Better way to respond? Okay. For a solution? How? If you, let's just say that at that particular time, okay, if you cannot look for solutions so fast, but you need to get yourself you don't in order like you need to first douse the fire before you find a solution right 
douse the fire. How are you going to douse the fire of anger, anxiety, stress, Recognize. suicidal tendencies? Recognize. Recognize. Be aware of it. Be aware. Okay, so it again comes back to awareness. So you can't run away from it, right? But then again, so here I would ask you to transform it. <coughs> So now, you look at the way you've always been doing things. If it works for you, great. If it doesn't work for you, let's try this. Okay. So now think to yourself that the event is an external event. It's external. It is not you. It is not inside you. It's not you. It is not inside you. It is outside of you. It appears real, but it is not true. So that is the dowsing the fire. Let's say that there are two things. Number one, it is outside of me. It is not me. Number two, it is real, but it is not true. It feels real. It feels so real, but actually it's just another mental deception. It's like a mantra. I learned it from my teacher, Sonia Rinpoche. So I'm teaching, I'm sharing this with you. Right? So I have to give credit, just like academic studies, we have to give credit, so I give credit to my teacher. It is it feels real, but it's not true. So it's another deception of the mind. Very quickly, try to see whether it works on your mind now. Give you 30 seconds to bring that incident to mind. Get all right up about it. Think of the way you've been responding and try this. It feels real, but it is actually not true does not exist inherently. There is nothing to grasp at. Number two, it is a phenomenon that is outside of me. Meaning that in control of your mind. The phenomena can, can come into your mind and screw up your mind. Are you in charge of the mind or is the phenomena in charge of your mind? So think, acknowledge that what you're feeling is, is it feels real, but it, it really truly isn't real. It's not true. It's not an absolute truth. It's just a moment-to-moment -moment feeling that comes, we grasp at it, we get angry, but actually it is not real. It's not true. And the second one I said just now was the phenomena is outside of you. You cannot, you, you are in absolute control of yourself. It's just like this. I've learned this wisdom from, from a lot of uh, uh, motivational speakers also. There is one particular motivational speaker, I must give her credit also here. I cannot steal her teachings, but it works very well. Her name is Sister Shivani from the Brahma Kumaris. Now she says that uh, the remote control is with whom? Check and see whether the remote control is with you or the remote control is with the phenomena. With us. So if we react negatively, right, meaning that meaning that we have passed the remote control to, to others. So it's like you get angry with A, you get angry with B, you get angry with C, then we say that I am angry because of them. So which means that we have passed the remote control to other people. So anybody can press the button and determine how we act like we are like uh, how do you say uh, puppets, you know, the puppet on the string. So somebody pulls our string. So somebody press this remote control to change channel. Somebody press the remote control to change channel. So we are like dancing like a puppet all the time. Is that really true? 
Is that, is that the way things operate in our minds? We give agency to others. Well, the true agency is with whom? Right. So, the most important thing is to reclaim your agency, right? So, the phenomena is happening outside. But the remote control is, is, is inside. If the phenomena is happening outside, so the remote control is outside or inside? So then how come we get upset? So then, then we say that it is the external phenomena, it is because of the external phenomena that we are actually upset. Is that really true? Can, there, can a, a, a phenomena influence the way you think? Or, or decide the way that you are going to think and react? Can it do that? Does it have that much power? Who has more power? You or the phenomena? How do you get the power? You give the remote control to the phenomena, you lose the power. Right? So how do you get the remote control back? How do you get the remote control back? Destroy it. <laughs> Destroy others? So that you will be able to annihilate the phenomena. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, the life is tough, we have to learn how to deal with it, yeah? So the first thing is, which is very empowering, to me at least, is that I have to learn that nobody can come into our minds and, and mess it up. It is we who allow others into our minds, it is we who allow the phenomena into our minds and, and, and mess it up, right? So here, I have this set of six Lojong teachings, mind training teachings, okay? We're supposed to be training our minds, isn't it? So one of the first cardinal rules is that we should not we should refrain from blaming others for the way we react. So it is because of venerable, that's why I am upset. It's because venerable is thin, that's why I'm fat. <laughs> right? So it's, you can see the contrast, isn't it? So it is. <laughs> so, so it is because you are like this. It's because that person acted that way. It's because that person didn't do their job, so I'm angry. It's because that person said a, a hurtful word to me, I'm angry. It's because that person said, it's always because of somebody else. So which means that that person has got absolute agency over the way we think, act and speak. Wow, how nice, right? So would you like, would, do you think that that person even has any agency at all? Or is it you who has the agency? We have the agency. So which means that we should be very careful when we actually shift the blame to others, right? Remember that the agency is with us. It's not with others, right? So be careful. Is it, is it correct to blame others? No? But it's very nice, isn't it? It's a very good and, you know, feeling a little as to blame other people. I know, I love it as well. But if it's not good, you know, I love to blame everybody else. But you didn't do this, you didn't do that, you didn't do that. So because of you, I'm upset. It's because of you, I'm late. It's because of you, you know. It's such a convenient way to shift the blame on others. So which means that others have taken the remote control and run away into the sunset. Yay! You know? And then we are crying here, we are upset, you know, does it make, even make any sense? It's we who are actually travelling from one birth to another, it's we who are going through the motions of life, but the remote control is somebody else. Does it even make any sense? Right? So, the, yeah. so here, training the mind, actually number one, is not to blame others, right? So, reclaim your agency. The agency meaning that you have got the power to, 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 to react the way you want to. But it's just the way society wants us to react. So we see our parents reacting this way, we become the same. We see our colleagues reacting this way, we become the same. I'm upset because of that person. I'm upset because of this person. It's a very fashionable way of saying things. It becomes so ingrained in our mind. We, 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 we tell ourselves again and again that this is the case. And then guess what? Because the power of the mind is so strong, the power of the mind is, what is why the mind is powerful. What you think is what is going to manifest. That is why. So you, you think that somebody has the agency, it manifests that somebody does have the agency. If you think that I have the agency, you reclaim your freedom. So if you think if you think that you can overcome a problem, you will overcome the problem. If you think that you are if you put your mind to it that it is going to manifest the way I, you know, am aspiring, 
so then it will manifest. So if, we, if it doesn't work that way, then what is the point of us doing aspiration prayers in Buddhism? We aspire to become the Buddha, we aspire to become Arahant, we aspire to become this, we aspire this, that, you know, may all sentient beings be happy. But in, may all sentient beings be happy, but we, we don't really believe it, you know, that we have the ability to make, to give happiness to others. It's just the saying, isn't it? Just to make ourselves feel nice, may all beings be free from suffering. Actually, it's got nothing to do with me. It's the karma. Is it really like this? Do you think that you, your mind doesn't have any role to play in, 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 in setting the motion to, to actually change the world, to transform the world? We actually have the power to transform the world. But first, transform ourselves. Right? How? We acknowledge that, that the feeling is so real. I'm not saying that you, you cannot get angry or anything like that. It's so, I'm, I'm so tired, I'm so overwhelming. Yes, it is, yes, yes, yes. So that's reconciliation. You know, it's like, yes, it feels so real, but it is not true, right? Because the agency is not with me. What is the untruth about it? The untruth about it is that I, I feel bad. I'm miserable, but guess what? The remote control is with me. So that's where the truth comes, unveils. So if you're aware, if you have all the first part of the, the sharing today, you, you, you have to develop that frame of mind, of being mindful and aware. And times of trouble, duress, that frame of mind will come back and help you. Right? If you're going about just mindlessly, so when you really need it the most, you don't train your mind, you will never be able to reclaim the agency. And then if I were to say that, you know, sister, I'm not omniscient and I'm not and I, and I do not have the power to, to to change people's karma. But guess what? I can always give a, a very good aspiration, give a good thought, spare a good thought for that person. May the sister recover. May the sister recover. May the sister be happy. May the world be happy. May climate change uh, be reversed, you know? And the climate change is not a real. I mean it feels real. But ultimately, it's not true. Why? Because we, through our own limited human minds, I'm not saying that we must not do have climate action. We must have climate action. But there's a sense of despondency, hopelessness, that climate change is irreversible and now we're doomed to die in the next 10 years. So they will be, they will be fried to death, you know, because of the, uh, you know, the, the uh, how to say, the, the temperatures, yeah? So global warming, so we are going to be fried. So is that true? It may be true. But it is only true if we keep on giving agency to phenomena. So it's time for us to wake up and, and, and reclaim this lost agency and then we have to tell ourselves that the world will be fine, you know, and I will make a difference, you know, the world will recover. When you put in that kind of force into the universe, the universe will manifest. So what kind of force we are putting in this world is the kind of the, the effects that we are seeing. So the, we always say that now the crime rates are so high, you know, it's, the world is getting terrible, people are getting terrible, then yes, whatever you think and whatever you say, that is what is going to manifest. And then we are the prophets of doom because we keep on saying it, we keep on thinking it over and over and over and over again in our minds, thinking that we are governed by the universe. Life is suffering because we allow it to, we allow ourselves to suffer. We, we have given remote control to phenomena, we have given the remote control to others. That is why life is suffering. If you claim back the remote control, the life will not be suffering anymore. If, even if it does suffer, you do suffer, you, you, you only, well, you, you will have pain. I'm not saying that pain won't come because we are governed by our past karmas. But I'm saying that you will not mentally suffer anymore. So you can change. And how do you change? By first acknowledging your what? First acknowledging that yes, whatever I'm feeling, I have the right to feel that way. I have the right to be miserable. Yes, yes, by all means cry for a few days. But after that, for, try to understand that you know you have the agency to turn your life around. First, stop blaming people. And secondly, think you know that whatever is happening is, is actually the, the causes and conditions I created it in the past lifetime is coming back to me acceptance right being aware of the entire process of the universe and once you are aware and you accept then what happens next is that you change the channel to suit your own recovery so that means you don't when once you stop blaming others 
then the solution lies with others or lies with yourself. Right? So, can we... So, do you understand the power of the mind now? Where is the power of the mind? The power of the mind is in the fairness. That is where, how you unleash the power of the mind. And then the second is that the mind must have a positive affirmation. <coughs> Take back the control from your from that you have given to others and then make sure that you have the, the you, you manifest what you want to see in this world through your thoughts, your speech and your action. Most of us do things like like for example I teach environmental politics, I teach the environment and all. But sometimes I also do not really believe that the world actually has got any hope in terms of climate. <laughs> then, then I'm not do, I'm doing a great disservice to myself, to the world, to my students. So then I added an, an extra chapter now after understanding this the chapter of hope. So hope meaning that I truly believe that climate change is reversible. And it's not that I'm just praying and sitting down on the cushion, may climate change be reversible, I don't do anything it's not like this. I do my part. But if at the back of my mind, climate change is reversible, the world will heal. My friends will heal. The phenomena is going to heal. The world will bounce back. You know, with this kind of positive affirmation, do you think that uh, if, if obstacles come, can we not transform them? Who is transforming them? The way we think transform. So if people were to shoot poison darts at us in the office, anywhere, then we we we, we become miserable and then we, we don't bounce back. It's like for example, if bad things happen to you now, people gossip, people slander, and then you have a choice, isn't it? Do you have a choice? So if you give if you give agency to others, meaning that you have no choice, right? So now what you learn from today is do you have a choice in the way that you react? And should we give control to others or, or we take absolute control of what happens in our minds? Okay. So we have five minutes for question and answers. Not that we have not asked questions anyway. We're asking all throughout, but five minutes just in case you would like to ask any questions. Yes. Yes, brother. How is it the media uh, is so powerful, you know? We are every day bombarded by all these news. So how can we control ourselves? Yeah. The, the media is so powerful. It's a very good question. So brother is asking me, uh, the media is so powerful. Yeah? How do we control ourselves? So the first thing is, the five precepts we remember, the fifth one is abstaining from intoxicants, right? Toxic material. So we have to be very discerning about what we what we consume. So our cons our consumption patterns are not only through our mouth, right? But it's also through our six other senses: our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, right, and mind. So whatever we we are also over consuming in terms of overthinking. So we are consuming toxins. So we keep on thinking that somebody else should be blamed. That also is actually toxic. So we look at uh, the media today, okay, if you if you were to look at it day and night, day and night, day and night, you will become negative, right? So I don't want to use the word negative positive, but I use the word in a way like, uh, like uh, you you need to be, you need to learn how, what kind of things are good for your mind. Brother? So it's like in the family also, you have got people who are complaining all the time. Do you, do you like to go to people who are energy vampires? Or you prefer to hang out with people who, who, who are enlightening, who are uplifting. So choose the company, choose your, um, your, choose your, um, whatever that you ingest, yeah, through your six senses. Choose it wisely. So if you listen to TV all day long, you're bound to be miserable. So you've got to be very discerning. Maybe see it for half an hour. And just think that everything that is happening is a is is a result of everybody's collective negative thinking. And I don't want to be part of this negative thinking. I'm going to change it by changing my mind to have positive thoughts for the world, for myself. I will achieve success. I will become a Buddha. I will 
help sentient beings come out from the samsara. I this world will heal, you know, and the world will be free from conflicts. So if you want to say the world is always going to be full of conflicts, it will. If you say that the world will one day be peaceful and there will be no conflicts and, and samsara will be empty, it will. So it's just a matter of time. Yeah? Have I answered your question? Be very careful about what you ingest. Thank you. Maybe one or two questions before we go. Uh, I think that's what we can do. Protect yourself. Insulate your mind. Yeah? Insulate your six senses and be very discerning about what you do. In jest, yeah? It's difficult, but <laughs> Sorry? I think it's very difficult. What you are wise is the best thing we can do. <laughs> the best thing you do, don't watch TV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Come here, come here. Don't. So if you really want me to tell you what to do, I will. Yeah? Actually, I was refraining from telling you what to do. I, I wanted the wisdom to develop from within you, but since you give me the authority now, so I'm going to tell you, switch off your TV, switch off your mobile phones when you don't like, like stay away from from negative media, stay away from gossip, uh, you know, rumor mongers, gossiping people, people who indulge in idle talk, stay away from all these kopitiam, uh, warong people, you know, uh, sitting in a mama shop at night, wasting your time away, and start meditating and reading the Dhamma, come to reject more often. <laughs> 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 Thank you, brother. Thank you. So the answer is very simple. Invest your time in, in wholesome activities and less time on negative input. Yeah? Any other question? Yes, sister? Oh, yeah, okay. I, I've been trying to ask you these questions. <laughs> okay, uh, I feel sometimes being too compassionate because uh, difficulty to yourself. Example, pandemic, right? So I own a business. So even two years, there's no business. But because being compassionate, you do not, um, uh, what you call that, uh, terminate any of your stuff. And uh, the overhead is so high. But because of being compassionate, you still go on paying your stuff. And me, myself, suffer. But because of compassionate. So, where does that remote control goes to? So I, I probably pass to Buddha then. <laughs> you know, how, how do I control that part? Well, my answer may not be very popular. Yeah, but uh, I, I think that you have to have compassion for yourself. First and foremost, be kind to yourself. Because, uh, and um, if you are, well, I'm not saying to pull the plug on all that. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that, um, you have to make sure that you are okay, yeah, before you can be of help to others. If you yourself are, are you know, drowning in the ocean, there's very little that you can do for others, right? So I think this is a timeless uh, advice, and I'm going to uh, recommend it to you that you first look into yourself and see what is the meaning of compassion, right? Do you have compassion for yourself? Are you being fair to your business partners or to your family? In being compassionate to others, are you being compassionate to the ones? Are you going to be? Are you heading for a, an economic disaster by being compassionate to others without applying it on yourself first? And this is where in Buddhism wisdom comes in, right? We have this. We have got the so-called six parameters. We have to be generous. You know, the first parameter is generosity, the second parameter is uh, what? Morality, third is uh, patience, fourth is effort, fifth is what? What is that called? Uh, meditation, sixth is wisdom. And together with all this giving, the generosity, morality, the wisdom is there with every single parameter that we have. Underlying everything that we do, I've said that the key to, um, well, unleashing the power of your mind is awareness, right? Right? But awareness has to be rooted in wisdom. So you, you see in, 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 in Mahayana Buddhism, we see that we have got the method right, and wisdom. So the method is uh, synonymous with uh, like your bodhicitta, your good heart, your kind, compassionate heart. That is one side. 
and, and your wisdom is the other side. So it's, you, you, a bird needs two wings to fly, right? You can't have a lopsided wing and then the bird's back. You can't fly. It, it, it doesn't work that way, right? Oops, it flew. <laughs> okay, so, well, you have to balance compassion with wisdom, right? And sometimes it's absolutely necessary to to you know to let go. So are you sure that yours is compassion and not clinging? Maybe you're clinging to a business that needs to be uh, to to be transformed. Maybe there's a different path for you and different path for your workers. Are you being fair to them by keeping them in a business that is not prospering? Are you being fair? So are you being fair to yourself to cling on to a business that is not going anywhere? Maybe a different venture is waiting for you, maybe a different career, uh, uh, life path is waiting for you. I'm not saying you become a monastic. I'm saying that maybe a diff diff different business venture is waiting for you. So remember this, you are probably flying now, you can't fly because your compassion is very high, right? But the wisdom is not there, so you're struggling. So uplift your wisdom by looking at all angles to see whether you're being fair to everybody, especially yourself. Who knows, by liberating your, your uh, employees, they find a better career. They, 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 you know, they will have a, you know, a better uh, life in the future. Yes, anyone else? My answer is not popular. It's not the answer that you want to hear, but I think it's absolutely necessary to balance compassion and wisdom. Yes. Yes, very good. Thank you for the sharing. Uh, I want to explore a little bit between uh, memory, memory and control. Uh, when I was talking about uh, Samyak Smriti, the right recollection, and then you said about uh, recollecting the teachings and bringing them to our lives. Sometimes we can remember, and then sometimes we try to remember, and then sometimes we totally forget. Then only after we make a mistake, then we remember. So, um, if we try to remember it, is it too much control over the mind? That's my first question. My second question is more like, how do you remember to remember, if you forget to remember? <laughs> got you there, yeah? <laughs> I'm in trouble. Okay. So how do you remember to remember, right? So the very fact, you see, now I'm being saved by my awareness, the key to unlocking the, unleashing the power of the mind. So without the, without the quality of awareness, it's very unlikely that you remember anything, right? So therefore, you need to develop it moment to moment. So when the awareness goes, right? then you need to very quickly bring it back to your uh, to your mind. So you have to have an object, right? That's why you need to balance. You can't just straight away jump into life and then remember everything. Your training actually starts with the meditation cushion. It does, but it doesn't end there. The training starts with the meditation cushion. You need to develop your concentration. So first thing is, how people forget is because they are cluttered, their minds are all over the place. So if you train your mind to always look at something over and over and over and over and over again, that one thing. So to me, I train my mind, I try at least, I'm also very forgetful, I try to look at something, my breath over and over and over again, the breath is the anchor. So when I look at my breath over and over and over again, so when my, when my thoughts go into the past, into the future, likes and dislikes, and then when suddenly I, I remember I bring it back to my breath. I bring it back to my breath. I bring it back to my breath. So even if you want to learn how to ride a bicycle, you still have to have hundreds of hours of training. Right? Maybe 10, maybe 20, maybe 100. So a pilot also needs to have hundreds of hours of flying before a person gets adapt at what he's doing, right? So in the same way, a meditator, a practitioner also, you need to put in the time and the effort to remember again and again that you've got to bring your recollection back to the breath, bring your mind back to the breath, bring it back to the breath. And that is actually indirectly helping you at the, at the base in order to gain to your, to strengthen your awareness. So you remember. So later on when you start, after 
maybe few years, no, not just kidding. Maybe, maybe after 10 minutes, well, 10, 10, 10 tries, 20 tries, you start seeing some kind of a, a dip, a improvement. You start to improve by. You, 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 it's not so difficult for you to bring your mind back to your breath anymore after 10 tries, 20 tries, 30 tries. And maybe after many, many years, you can actually be in the very deep concentration and your awareness is fully developed. Am I making any sense? Yeah. yeah thank you. Thank you very much. Venerable, may I share something in answer to yes. uh, this brother? Thank you for saving me. I think that's the <laughs> A Dharma friend taught me this, right? How to practice awareness. She said, the moment you feel unhappy or even a little bit dissatisfied, then switch on your awareness and try to find out what is causing it. So then, then, then your 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 mindfulness will kick in. Uh, for example, I I always feel dissatisfied with the way my mate does this and that. So then I suddenly realized what she said. Why are you dissatisfied? Then I watched my mind, and 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 then I I learned to uh, accept it and just tell her nicely next time. Please do like this. So, so uh, this is one way, like. Uh, so, how do you remember? Always, when you feel dissatisfied, then you switch on the awareness. I think it's a simple solution. Thank you. Yeah, brother. Another skillful means for you, right? So and there are various ways. Yes, it's another problem. thing I like to share is uh, about how to face a, a crisis especially when we have health issues right one way that i develop and i mean i i i, I help to solve my issue is that i realize that nothing is permanent that very understanding helped me to cope with whatever issue i'm facing i know that this too shall pass just like the covid so with that understanding i begin to develop patience waiting for this problem to end and in the meantime look for solutions so that that is one way how uh, uh, the, the way i cope with, with life okay brother yeah so you've got a lot of wisdom from, from uh, you know uh, elderly practitioners i think it is very important the life wisdom you find your own way which works for you right so the training will start by developing your awareness in various different ways and one of the very important ways is for you to be able to um, meditate daily you spend 5 minutes or 10 minutes in the morning and evening so that your mind is tuned to coming back to the object of focus right so that's very important and sooner or later your mind becomes very 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 alert alertness is there so once the quality of alertness is there then uh, your recollection becomes easier, right? A very sluggish mind, lazy mind, you know, uh, up and down mind. A mind that is not still is very susceptible to being forgetful. So a mind that is alert, so alertness you develop through your shamatha meditation. Yeah. Thank you. And anyone else? I don't know whether I have enough time for any question. One more. One last question. So you can I? Just one here. Yes. Final one, not related, but you were mentioning. You were mentioning that the uh, Jara is a shortcut to, you know, to the teaching. Why is that so? How, how, how did the misconception come in? Or maybe the truth? I, I'm not enlightened yet, so I, 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 I will refrain from saying what is real, real and what is not, yeah? But my enlightened gurus, um, and, and our enlightened gurus, all of us, we, we, we have absolute faith that the Vajrayana teachings uh, do actually result in enlightenment in, in a single life, that provided you make effort as if your hair is on fire, right? So most, it, what I'm trying to say is that you make effort day and night, day and night and day and night, and you've got practices, 
uh, which actually uh, this like skillful means, you know, the practices are very rich in terms of visualizations, and we also have got yogic practices in order to uh, you know, which deal with our uh, like subtle body, with, uh, the channels, the winds, the drops, you know. So these practices conjoined with uh, the sutra tradition. So we call it the tantric tradition. The tantric tradition deals with uh, the, the body, the channels, the drops, the winds of the body, visualization. Yeah, so the, like yoga is not only the bodily yoga. For us, we have got deity yoga. We have got guru yoga. So we are actually meditating on our teachers and then visualizing a whole lot of things. And then you had a glimpse of it this morning when the Buddha's body settles dissolve into you. So Vajrayana Buddhism is rich with all these kinds of practices, right? Uh, and utilizing uh, skillful means, meaning that you have visualization, you have got, you have got mantras, you have got uh, you know, like, uh, the musical instruments in order to orientate your mind towards um, invoking the subtle most, um, the subtle most mind. So we are actually at the gross level on the table. So Vajrayana Buddhist tradition actually has has ways to tweak the mind, like 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 I mentioned just now the the cow you know, like in the past we lock up people are like you know, but this is that is very inhumane. We are not beating people. We are using skillful means like music and all because we are using six sense senses yeah in order it's like six sense fight the six sense. You get what I mean? So we are all very interested in, in, in grasping the things that we like, you know, nice sound, nice smell, nice taste, everything we have. We've got, if we talk about sound, we've got nice musical instruments, we've got taste, we've got lovely song offerings. If we've got, the, if we talk about uh, visuals, we've got beautiful tankas and all these things. Why? Because the teachers knew that we are greedy, we are all the time attached to this, attached to that. So instead of taking it away from us, then our minds will start resisting. So why you took away my music? Why do you take away my tankas? You know? Why do you take away beautiful things? I want to see beautiful things. I want to enjoy beautiful sounds, but enjoy it within a pure environment. An environment, a controlled environment which is which will orientate your mind towards enlightenment. So you don't need to go to the pub to enjoy it. You don't need to go, you know, and indulge in, in external things in order to enjoy the six senses. But we indulge in it within the framework of our liturgy, liturgical text or something else. So then, we, then, once we have had enough of it, we dissolve it and then we steal our minds and rest in the true nature of our minds. So it's like giving a child a toy. We tell the child, don't do. The child will take a longer time to respond. You, tell, you give a child a, a skillful, a nice little toy. You say, say, okay, now, you play with this and then, you know, you, you give some instructions, the child will follow faster. If you tell the child not to do, the child will, will think of something else to do and then the development will be slower. So that's Vajrayana Buddhism 101. Am I making any sense? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so I think I will overrun uh, the time as usual. <laughs> so I think uh, I would like to give thanks to the organizers and the Dhamma brothers and sisters who have come here. To, uh, you know, to listen to some sharing and actually you all are the ones who participated so I benefited from you and I hope that uh, you have something to take away from today's uh, sharing and I apologize if I have uh, said or done anything wrong to body speech and mind and I would like to make a disclaimer that whatever teachings that you've heard today they are not mine they are that I owe everything to the Buddha and all enlightened masters yeah. Thank you so much. So we will do a short dedication. Is that okay? Thank you so much. So we will do a dedication in Tibetan. Is that okay, organizer? Or you have a special way of doing your dedication? Yeah,
Thank you so much. Sa- 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 Sa-